It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 309 of Science on Top. Today is Sunday the 9th of September 2018. I'm Ed Brown and today I'm joined by Penny Dumsday. Hello. And Lucas Randall. Hello. And today we'll be talking about omnivorous sharks and the water-rich exoplanets. But first, tickets are on sale now for the Astronomy Revolution talk by Dr. Pamela Gay, as well as a question and answer session and a live recording of Science on Top. That's on Wednesday the 10th of October in Melbourne, Australia at 7pm. Tickets cost 20 bucks, all of which goes to the costs of putting on the night and the rest will be donated to the non-profit Astronomical Society of the Pacific. Just go to scienceontop.com slash live to grab your tickets. It's scienceontop.com slash live. And actually, speaking of Pamela Gay, uh, she'll also be talking in Sydney on that weekend at the Australian Skeptics National Convention, alongside a host of other amazing speakers, uh, Dr. Carl, uh, Dr. Brad Mackay, Dr. Alan Duffy, Dr. Lynn Kelly, even some people who haven't been on Science on Top will be speaking. I was going to say, you just <laughs> people who have been on the show. <laughs> There's a lot of really cool speakers. Um, it, it, it should be really, really cool. Uh, so grab your tickets, go to convention.skeptics.com.au. So that's on the weekend, must be the 13th and 14th of October, up in Sydney. And one final announcement, get these all out of the way at the start, scienceontop.com slash donate is where to go if you want to help support the show by becoming a Patreon. You choose how much you want to donate on a per episode basis, and it all helps pay the cost of putting this show together. And now we should move on and actually do the show. Do this So let's start off with TRAPPIST-1. About two years ago, the announcement of seven rocky Earth-sized worlds around a dim star called TRAPPIST-1 caused a lot of excitement. It's rare that we find rocky Earth-like worlds and even rarer to find them so relatively close to Earth. They're around 39 light years away. Well now, new research published in the journal Astronomy and Astrophysics reveals the density of those exoplanets and suggests that some of them could have up to 5% of their mass in liquid water form, which is about 250 times as much water as found in Earth's oceans. Lucas, I find this fascinating that we can determine the likely density, let alone composition, of small rocks orbiting a dim star 39 light years away. It's pretty cool. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And especially since that some of the, the normal um, methods in our toolkit are not available to us with this particular configuration, with this particular system, because as you said, the star is, is very dim. So we're pretty much limited to, to one technique in order to, to figure this out. Uh, and this is the transit timing variations. Um, so it, it's, it's exactly what it sounds like. Basically, you, you, for each of the planets, and, and just to recap on, on, in terms of TRAPPIST, one of, the, one of the very fortunate things about this system is the, it's, it's ecliptic, which is the path, if you can imagine like a, imagine a dinner plate around uh, a lump of mashed potato lump of mashed potato in the middle is the star dinner plate is the part is is the the plane on which all of the the planets um will will orbit that star more or less you know with, with slight variations and and the reason that they they tend to do that is because when stars form they they tend to form from a, a disk of spinning material so the material that doesn't go into the star itself basically clumps together you know in other regions of that disk and and turns pro, uh, becomes protoplanets and then the protoplanets sort of collect all their other material clear out their orbit which is one of the criteria to be a planet and and bingo you've got your star system so it just so happens that this one's aligned such that we can we can look along that that plane and and we can see these these planets 
going across the star in front of us, which is a transit, which we talked about many times before. Um, but because it's so dim, we, we don't get to use some of the other really cool uh, techniques that, that uh, we have in our arsenal to, to measure stuff. But transits, along with um, to this, uh, this transit uh, timing variation where you, you're timing the the period or the the events of it transiting the star um, and then looking for small variations in the amount of time that it takes um, to, to transit between each of its transits uh, and then you combine that with its measured um, you know the radius of that orbit and that can give you the mass um, so you know, lots of crazy maths in, in between there. But yeah, it's really, really cool that we can do this at such large distances. But what's really helped this team hone in? So this is uh, Simon Grimm, who's an exoplanet scientist at University of Bern in Switzerland. Um, what what ha- he and his team have been able to do is they've, they've used um, models that had been previously put together for tracking and calculating orbits of other exoplanets. And they basically retrofitted those models to the observation that had been made of of, uh, of Trappist uh, a Trappist one and its system, and what they did was they because there are so many uh, of these planets, there's this like seven of these things that are you know, just perfect perfectly lined up for us. There's so many transits that have now been observed. Um, there was over 200 transits that they were able to use to hone in their data, and. So what they did basically, they tweaked their model, tweaked their model to figure out what the masses and um, uh, overall densities were of these these worlds, so that it all fits the observations. So you know we've talked about before about modelling and how important modelling actually is in order to um, to to give us a, a greater sense of things. So when you when you're modelling um, anything from planetary orbits, exoplanet orbits, or indeed things like you know climate uh, data, if you run your model over what you know for sure, it should predict the same outcome as what you've observed, and that's where they got to. So the model was actually what indicated to them that these these planets have got such high uh, ratios of, of water in them and on them, on them, or part of them, around them. Um, <laughs> and some of them also have quite dense atmospheres. So they, so we don't know a great deal more than that yet. Um, it might, may well be that, um, you know, these are intensely tropical type settings. If you can imagine, you know, there's a habitable zone, right temperature level, lots of water, um, then they're therefore not as likely to be kind of Venus-like um, because the, the, the mix is not right, the, the amount, you know, because there's so much water involved. So they could just be, you know, just picture like a, an endlessly raining tropical world. It could be something like that. If there's life there, that would just be so cool. Um, but it's not just one, it's several of them. And then even the outer planets appear to have a lot of water, and that's, you know, of course, most likely to be in a frozen state. So there might be sort of ice worlds. But as you mentioned in the intro, these planets are all um, rocky planets. So it's just... You know, of course, my mind's going nuts thinking of all the the, uh, the sci-fi applications <laughs> here. I can imagine this actually being, you know, if you believe in in you know transpermia or something, maybe maybe we're from there, you know, and and this is the sort of place that life could have begun. Maybe it's really cool. It, I, I love it. It's 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 very exciting, and um, to think that you know, as you said, it's a it's a, it's a little while ago now that um that this system was was uh, discovered but more data more information comes out as our observational techniques get better and better and we dial in on the models and it's just a, a absolutely fascinating system but i think that's what makes it so interesting to me is that we it wasn't that long ago really it was 2016 that we discovered yeah. these planets and since then there's been over 200 transits now obviously there's seven of them so that's 200 divided by 7 each, but that must still mean that they have a fairly quick orbital period. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. Remember, this is a this is quite a small mass star. So, in order for them to be in the habitable zone, they have to be quite close into the star, mm. which means shorter orbits. Um, you know, shorter orbit yeah. uh, periods. So, uh, so yeah, it's just it's like <laughs> if you could have wished for a scenario that would ina- allow you to study the planets. This would be it, you know what I mean? Because as you said, you've got these these rapid years that they have because they're going around so fast, they're so close mm. into the system, but they're still in their orbital zone, and they're less than forty light years away. It's like it's just a really nice combination of things to be able to study them. Yeah, very cool. 
and as you say, it's, it's all about modeling. So we haven't actually detected water or anything on them, but we've determined that based on their orbital periods and all that sort of time, their orbital time, they're likely to have large amounts of water. Yes, and, and, and as you said, it's, it comes down to we know what their transit period is. We know what their, the, radio, radi, the, the radius of their orbits are. We know what the mass of their parent star is. And because we know those things, we can work out they must have a mass of this much to be that far away from their star with an v- orbital velocity of this. And in order for that to be true and to match up with the dimming that we see when they cross over their star then here are the densities so yeah it's it's kind of it's it's all uh, this stuff just boggles my mind the fact that we can we can derive so much from such uh, what seemingly small you know data points is is just so cool it, it becomes just giant equations eventually you know if orbital period is this if star uh, density and mass is that if this number of planets are this close, then composition equals that and all that sort of stuff. You just yeah. you put all these pieces of the puzzle together to get the result. It's it's extraordinary. Yeah. It is. Yeah, it's so cool. Yeah. And speaking of water, let's talk about sharks, shall we? <laughs> they are perhaps the most feared marine animals, the quintessential apex predators of the oceans. And while we used to think they were all terrifying carnivores it seems some might be just as happy to eat their veggies. Penny, one of the most common sharks in the world, the bonnethead, is the first variety of shark to be determined to be an omnivore. Is that right? Yeah, it is. And I thought this was really interesting because, um, as it often says in the intro, I'm a science teacher, and as such, <laughs> I've uh, presented many, many, many food webs in my time. And the sharks are never, never, never... Um, connected to the vegetation. They're always eating, you know, the third or fourth order sort of consumer. They're at the top of the food chain. We think of them as exclusively um, meat eaters and carnivores. Um, However, what this research has shown is that the bonnet head sharks um, get a lot of their nutrition from seagrass. And what's really interesting is that um, reports of them eating seagrass have been a while around for a while but it's been just assumed because of what we know about other sharks that this was sort of incidental consumption it's not an important part of their diet and it's interesting that because what an animal eats is not necessarily what it's digesting and what it's getting its nutrients from I mean I guess in times of stress you know the first thing that came into my head was you know people trying to eat grass and stuff which yeah you can eat it but it's not going to necessarily um be a useful right part of your diet, yeah. break down, be digested, become part of you, which leads me to what I really enjoyed about this study because just observing the sharks eating the seagrass is one thing. So there's a behavior that they're practicing, but are they actual omnivores? Has Is their digestive system adapted to cope with grass? Because another thing as a biology teacher that I've often done is shown diagrams of the digestive tracts of different kinds of animal. And you can essentially just look at it and pick its diet. Like if it's short and sweet, it's a carnivore. If it's got chambers and this and that and miles and miles Mm. and miles of intestine, it's going to be eating um, plant matter. And if it's somewhere in between, it's probably an omnivore. So to see if the sharks truly do get nutrients from sea grass, it seems like quite a, um, you know, not, not a really complex experiment but a very interesting one they got seagrass from florida bay took it to the lab and replanted it and added um sodium bicarbonate powder which had a specific carbon isotope so what this means is they're able to track where those carbon isotopes end up um to see if the carbon from the seagrass is going to eventually be incorporated into the sharks or not that is so cool isn't that cool that is really cool it's really cool. Like, it's not an unusual way of studying um, thing, like how things work, but it, it's just not something – like, it, I just like how they took it a step further from just observing the behaviour of the st- oh. sharks and maybe dissecting one and having a look at its – It's um, not something I would have thought of doing, that's for sure. 
I wouldn't have thought to replant a seagrass field, that's for sure. <laughs> but anyway, so they caught the sharks, they brought them in, they were for three weeks fed on um, seagrass and squid, so they could eat squid as well. And they all put on weight, so yay for the It sounds like a meal that you could get in a, in a hipster Melbourne I know. cafe, <laughs> doesn't it? Seagrass and squid? Yeah, I've heard it's I'm really not, good. Not surf and turf, but something, something <laughs> along those lines. <laughs> Um, what they found is that um, the, fi- the the sharks could digest the seagrass. They had enzymes that broke down starch and cellulose. Uh, they didn't really have teeth to chew the grass, but it could be that the st- stomach acids can weaken the plant cells. And more than half of the organic material locked up in the sea- in the seagrass was digested by the sharks. So that's actually pretty good. That puts them on a par with um, green sea turtles and other omnivorous animals they also found that there was lots of the um seagrass isotope the carbon isotope in the shark's blood and liver tissue which is showing that they're actually using that digested food it's not just a source of fiber or roughage or something Mm. it's becoming part of them which is really weird when you think about that everything we eat becomes part or not everything you know what i mean the food we eat has the potential to become part of us so this is the first known omnivorous species of shark they've been observed to eat seagrass in the wild they ate it in a lab they didn't just eat it but they took up nutrients from it and produced enzymes to digest it so this is really important i mean one it means we need to rethink what it means to be a shark but also it, 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 we need to rethink especially how seagrass meadows um, as ecosystems are managed. It's a different uh, kind of food chain there that we need to be aware of and some bonnet heads can make the seagrass up to 60% of their diet. So the management of seagrass meadows is really important for this species of shark. And we have talked before about these um, seagrass meadows and how they're important for dugongs and manatees, which are relying on them. And because uh, climate change is affecting the amount of seagrass meadows around, yeah. they're at uh, greater risk now and it's it's quite dire for a lot of them. So it could also be affecting sharks now as well. Yeah. But also, uh, I'd never actually heard of bonnet heads before, even though no, they're, I mean, they're, they're common. They're an was- unfortunate looking animal. They I was expecting look- them to look like something out of The Handmaid's Tale, but for sharks. And <laughs> I'm not entirely disappointed, but... <laughs> no. No, they, they kind of... They look like a, the, the, the somewhat less disturbing and frightening cousin of the hammerhead. Um, and their eyes seem really... Yeah. ...off to the side. So, they, they look like grazers. They look like they should be grazers. Yeah. Which, obviously, they are. 60% of the time. <laughs> Uh, I guess let's finish up with a few brief uh, space stories, Lucas, because it was a bit worrying earlier this week when uh, some of the astronauts on the International Space Station were um, given warnings by NASA who had noticed that the cabin pressure was uh, decreasing. It wasn't anything to worry about too much, and they were able to just find the leak and patch it up. But it was clearly a hole that had been drilled Someone had tried to drill a hole. There were sort of misses near it where the, the drill had slipped. And that led some people to say this could be sabotage or something. Do you have any news on that? What's the latest with that? It does. Uh, the, the leading theory at the moment is that it was something that was caused on Earth before launch. Um, but reading through the... the There were some people who commented who, who were not... Um, uh, authorized to speak with the media, so they had to do so under the condition of anonymity. And anonymity, and if that happens, you can only really take it with a grain of salt what mm. they say anyway. So it's hard to sort of thread together a narrative here. But it does seem that the uh, the scenario is is they think it probably happened on Earth. But one of the last things that actually happens apparently with these with these capsules, and th- these capsules are used. Oh, sorry. We didn't actually explain that. It yeah, was not sorry. the ISS itself that was uh, that that had a hole in it. It was this this part of the orbital module of the Soyuz um, capsule that was attached to the ISS. So this capsule launched on August 30, and um, uh, basically once it docked, NASA had noticed over that 
evening because ISS tracks that are like they, they have a uh, a time zone that they observe. So for them, it was their evening, and they and NASA was tracking, it and they've gone, hmm, we're seeing a, a drop in in the pressure inside ISS because you know that monitor that that's important um and uh so anyway overnight they sort of they were tracking it and they're going okay so when the when the crew you know were all uh, firing the next morning they said look can you investigate this we've got an issue they found this hole as you mentioned before uh, i think there were stories about one of the astronauts sort of ah oh, here's a hole and they put their finger over it so what should we yes. do about this hole <laughs> um so there was there was stuff in the media about that but uh, basically they they sealed it up with some epoxy resin so it was it's not a, a a huge big deal and i guess you've got to you've got to bear in mind that the 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 pressure at, in the ISS is is nothing like the pressure of say a submarine, right? So a submarine is is the reverse of that. You've got immense pressure on the outside pushing down on the capsule. Um, in space, you've got a vacuum outside, and then you've got basically just over one one atmosphere of pressure inside. So there's not a huge, you know, there's not a huge um, pressure on the on the capsule from that. Um, so, so it wasn't, wasn't, a, you know, they weren't under any, in any danger apparently. So, and, and NASA have said there was no immediate danger to the, to the crew and they, they weren't particularly concerned. And of course the ISS is segmented in such ways that they can seal off bits and stuff like that as well. So, so there was no, you know, major drama there, but of course the question is, you know, cause initially they thought that would have been something like a micro media, uh, micro, um, meteorite impact that you know because as we know there's a lot of stuff in space right and 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 even when things are really really small if they're going at significant fractions of um you know of, of the speed of light as can be the case well they're going to do some damage no matter how small they are so they thought it was probably one of that but then when they investigated and as you said in the intro they found that it was a, a very much a perfect circle which is not what they would expect, and they and then they also did find, as you said, some other markings around it, which they've interpreted as perhaps some other drill impacts or something like that. Now, there's not much they're going to be able to do about this in terms of forensically because this part of the Soyuz doesn't actually survive re-entry. So when it comes back to Earth, it's not like they can stick it in a lab and have a look at it. Um, it's going to be lost on the way down. The crew capsule obviously does, because otherwise it would be pointless. So, um, so yeah, they're not really going to know. But, but as I said, the, the, one of the last places that this thing goes to before it launches is a pressure chamber test assembly area where they, they do these pressure tests and it passed those pressure tests, which, which you would think would mean that there was not a hole in it mm. when it went through that stage. And from that point, like before that point, it's under intense security, apparently, according to these sources who are unnamed. So it does seem odd to me that like, because the, the theory is that it happened on Earth. But if that were the case, and the last one of the last things it did before it launched was a pressure test, and then it was immense security, how could that have happened? I don't know. Well, presumably it could have been patched up with some sort of epoxy, which is what they did uh, up in space when they found it. But if you drilled somewhere by mistake, went, whoops, that shouldn't happen, and then you patch it up, and it survives those initial pressure tests, then goes up and in if it's, orbit. Look, that, that, that is a, that's a, 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 a workable hypothesis. But if that were the case, that's almost as bad as if it was a deliberate sort of attempt to undermine it because, man... I mean, not owning up to your screw up in that circumstance in, yeah. endangers not just the crew of the Soyuz, but the crew of the ISS. That's just a serious. So who knows? It, it, it's really strange, and that's why it sort of was was uh, something that that I know I I think you have, but I've been tracking as well. It's just a really odd mm. one to occur. It is. Um, and and the fact that there were these other marks as well. If it was just one hole, you could maybe imagine that there was something that pierced it during something that was going on. Who knows? I don't know what the process is, but uh, but if there were multiple things that were visible on the inside, that's just weird. It's not like you'd be drilling equipment onto the wall. Let's just put this here. Oh, I want to hang a picture. <laughs> well, they were hanging a here. painting, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, it's just weird, man. It's weird. Well, the, the photos that I've seen, it's clearly a drill hole. It's like a perfect circle and everything. This isn't a, a, like a micro meteorite has torn a chunk out of it. Can we have right. seen? you know, yes. tiny specks of paint and the damage that it can do at that velocity. Yeah. Um, so this is clearly someone tried a few times and then got it right and drilled through it. But, 
Yeah. Again, it, weird. It, weird. I agree. I mean, Very if you, weird. If you're going to patch it, there'd be other ways of patching it. Because as I said, this is not immense pressure, right? So you, you're only dealing with an atmosphere or, or a little bit more. So you do something like... Uh, yeah, I can imagine like what they use with tyres and stuff, where you push something through and it's bigger on the inside so it can't be pushed out through the hole again, that sort of thing. I mean, that... It's just weird, man. <laughs> it's just very strange. So, yes. yeah. There were lots of um, articles and discussions about, you know, if it was sabotage, was it someone on the ISS who was, you know, had gone mental and was having mental illness issues? And then you, you, there was, there's you know, all these stories of hallucinations of people who... Because it's obviously it's a very different environment that you're in from a psychological point of view. You're so isolated. There's no chance of getting back to your comfort zone and back to earth anytime soon necessarily it can really mess with your head and there's procedures sure, but if you that wanted that outcome there are so many things they could do to cause immense and immediate you know problems sure. not just a little two mil hole like it's just it's yep. just weird that's what i mean there's nothing about the <laughs> it, it's a very odd scenario and i think more information is going to come to light. This is a story that's going to keep on going for some time, so we will follow it as best we can and keep an eye on it. But, but, but as I said, the thing's not going to reach Earth, so they can't do a lot more to test it than what they've already done, which is mm. frustrating because mm. I'm sure if they could get this thing, you know, under a microscope, they could actually start to really understand, you know, they could probably nail it down, nail it down. They could probably <laughs> uh, narrow it down to a particular drill bit. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. and that yeah. could give us a lot of information, but, but up there, they, they, they just haven't got the equipment. So yeah, oh, well. weird. We'll see what happens with that. Um, and just very quickly, I think, uh, NASA has announced that they're still looking for the Opportunity uh, rover on yeah. Mars, which went quiet uh, during a massive dust storm that encircled the whole planet. Just think about that, a weather event that covers an entire planet. And so we didn't hear from uh, Opportunity for, was it three months or so? And now yeah, that, that Ju June it was, wasn't it? So, yeah. yes. Yep. And now that dust uh, storm has settled, I think it's still going a bit, but it's nowhere near as uh, scary as it was before. Uh, and they're waiting for an opportunity to get enough light to power up and uh, report home. But uh, they're only giving it a few days, like 45 days, is 45 it? 45 days. And that, the weird thing about this is that when Spirit died, like both of the rovers have died several times because of other stormy things. Uh, and they've stopped stopped communicating, and that's to be expected, right? Because as you said, they they lose power to their solar cell, solar cells. They're going to be able to charge their batteries. So what they do is they go into like a hibernation mode, where they are able to, um, you know, maintain certain key systems and just kind of wait it out. Um, so it's assumed that I mean, there's 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 no reason to think that just the dust on the cells would stop Oppie from coming back later on, especially since they're apparently coming to a season where it's known that certain winds ha um, can clear the, the, the solar cells, and it's happened before. And apparently th those winds... Um, as such that they can they've cleared the cells almost to the to the point that, that they're polished as clean as when the thing arrived so so that there's an expectation that that will occur at some point soon and what's there's some engineers that have that are um, ex and current engineers who have worked on opportunity and spirit who who have really questioned this timeline that NASA have have announced saying what what's the hurry like we gave months to spirit when we last tried to, you know, when it, when it went dead for the final time. Um, whereas now you're saying we're only going to actively listen for 45 days and then we'll just go to passive tracking, which is if we pick up a signal from one of the many things, you know, that are, that are monitoring, then great. Um, so they're going to stop sending signals. They're going to stop us, you know, trying to communicate with it. They're just going to go, eh, we'll just wait and see. Um, it is a bit weird. You got to wonder why is it a is it a resource shuffling thing? Maybe they're. I mean, because you got to remember these things. These these both these rovers had a had just what was what was it a six day mission, mission time yeah. ninety ninety day mission something like that. I mean, and now we're up to fifteen years. <laughs> yeah, um, but that's it's clearly kind of the point, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, when Spirit died, that was in twenty ten, yeah. and they spent months looking for that. You know, this is right. eight years later. 
now and we're worrying about a probe that was only supposed to last six months anyway uh, yes. three months sorry three anyway months. and you know we're sending all these other missions mars 2020 and all that to mars now do we need it was it doing anything that useful oh yes it was i, I don't know yes it okay. was doing things useful and that's that's the thing and this is where you know yes we've got missions coming up and yes those missions are going to have uh, their own resourcing, right? Which is all cost, cost, cost. Get that. But you've got, if you've got a, an asset that has sensors that is able to give you data and it's in an area where there's some, there's nothing else other than orbiters, that's an asset and you, you would look after that asset. I mean, just think of, you know, we're still getting, we're still getting usable science from the Voyager probes for God's yeah. sake. So, you know, th- this is, this is something that, you know, it costs a heck of a lot of money to get it there. So, yeah, I mean, if it goes dead, it goes dead. And, hey, it's still been an amazing little robot for sure. But uh, it does seem a little bit odd from what and, – and, and this is what these other engineers have been saying. You know, there's a few that have tweeted about it going, what's going on? Why, why are we walking away from it? It's there. It's an asset. It still has science to do. It just seems odd. So I think that's the newsworthy part of this is that – Again, it's weird. It's like the hole in the ISS. It just doesn't make a lot of sense. So, yeah, who, who knows? Maybe it is just a case of NASA going, look, all we're saying is that we're not going to actively pursue this. We're not going to put resources onto it that weren't already there. We're just going to go, if it wakes up, it wakes up. That'll be great. If it doesn't, well, it's, you know, it's outlived. It's, but many times over outlived its original yeah. uh, time frame. Sure. But, uh, yeah, it'll be, a, it'll be a shame for it to... Uh, uh, to drop off it would i guess i am kind of heartened though that there are nasa scientists who feel okay with voicing their dissatisfaction and questioning these decisions uh because that's the culture of transparency that you want where people that's a really good question point. uh yeah. decisions from the higher ups that's a scientific environment how it, that's how it should be so yeah yeah no it's a really good point um and it's something I hadn't really thought of, but yeah, that you're right. The fact that there are current people involved who are mm. who, are, who are questioning this is is a really good point. It's funny you were saying before, what's it doing? One of the, the uh, ironically, one of the things that that uh, Opportunity is able to do is to help measure the uh, the tau, which is basically the opaqueness of the atmosphere of of, of Mars. Um, because oh, so how much that, dust is in the air? Pretty much. So ironically. Ah. <laughs> Without opportunity doing that, they can't figure out what the density of the atmosphere is, which means they can't get an accurate read on how much sunlight would be hitting anything, including opportunity. So, <laughs> so right it's now, the instrument off the charts. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's one of the things that it does. But uh, yeah, oh, look, fingers crossed. I mean, it's been a while, but it, I, I just have a feeling. I have a feeling it'll come back. I'd love it if we were talking about this in three years' time, and there was some <laughs> citizen science group that got together and went, "We're going to wake the sort up." Of thing that happens yeah. <laughs> yeah do you remember that probe that was i can't remember which one it was now but it was like been drifting for like 20 years or something yeah. other than it was catching up with earth i yeah. do very good let's uh, keep an eye on it and hope for the best and that's our show and as always the links we talked about are in the show notes and on the web at scienceontop.com slash 309 you can always help us out Go to scienceontop.com slash donate to support us on Patreon and help keep the show going. Don't forget to get your tickets to see Dr. Pamela Gay live in Melbourne on Wednesday the 10th of October. Go to scienceontop.com slash live and go to convention.skeptics.com.au to get your tickets to the Sydney National Convention for Skeptics, uh, which will be a fantastic event. I'm really excited. I'll be there. Uh, Lucas, I think you're still on the fence about whether you can not, you can go. It it, it it'll come down to my time frame at the time, but uh, yeah, I'd, I'd like to go if I can. Uh, should be good. We'll have the links to all of those in the show notes as well. Thanks a lot for joining me today, Penny and Lucas. You're welcome. Thanks, Ed. And thank you everyone for listening. We'll be back again next week, putting science on the top of the agenda. Join us then. Stop giving power to people who don't believe in science, or worse than that, pretend they don't believe in science for their own self-interest. They know who they are. We know who they are. We are all 
rich or poor, powerful or powerless, we will all suffer the effects of climate change and ecosystem destruction, and we are facing what is quickly becoming the greatest moral crisis of our time, that those least responsible will bear the greatest costs.